Okay, you guys, welcome back. Today we're going to talk about spinal, uh, cerebral palsy and spinal bifida. Um, and this one's going to be a relatively short one because we're going to be talking about developmental conditions, both uh, developmental and neurodevelopmental conditions. Uh, but this one's going to be relatively short because of the way I'm doing it in class during a certain week. Uh, but then there'll be another one on neurodevelopmental conditions that we'll go off through after this. So this will be a little bit shorter, I think. So the first thing we want to do is we want to understand how we classify these things because there are these umbrellas that we use. We understand all these developmental conditions and then some of them are neurodevelopmental, others are not so much. They're just not called that because of the way they show up. So sometimes just understanding how these things, all these terms fit together is kind of important. So what we're talking about here is in order for it to be a developmental condition, it has to be present at birth, so part of the de early developmental process, and then it has to persist throughout life. In other words, it's not like it's just going to go away at some point. When I was a kid, I had asthma, and I had asthma pretty bad, but then it kind of can go away at some point in life. So you wouldn't call that necessarily a developmental condition, even though it was developed early in my life. Right? So this is, a lot of this is just how we classify and understand these things. So uh, our text references this uh, Developmental Disability Assistance and Bill of Rights Act. And what we're trying to understand here is when it comes to developmental disabilities just in general, so before we get to the stuff about cerebral palsy, uh, what does that even mean? What is a developmental disability? So it is both that first bullet point and it's these other things. It's attributable to a mental and physical impairment or combination of those two. So it could be either or or both. Uh, it manifests before the age of 22. Why 22? Because that's the age at which we think the brain is kind of done forming and shaping itself. And then it can be still malleable, but it's not its not really going to grow any bigger or more complicated or more complex, something like that. Like you can mature in the way that you're using it, but it's not going to continue to grow, something like that. So that's, that's why 22. Again, it's likely to continue indefinitely. And the results, uh, it results in a substantial functional limitation in several categories. There's different categories in there. Uh, I'm not going to go through all of them right now. It's, most of these things, by the way, they're really complicated. And it really requires a lot of training and education to spot this specific disability. A lot of us find ourselves in kind of this generalist position where we're trained to talk about lots of different kinds of disabilities. And we get exposure to lots of different kinds. But we're not experts in that very, very specific thing. And so when we talk about uh, categories like this, they're going to sound familiar to other things, like categories, like uh, limitations in adaptive functioning, executive functioning, uh, different variations of uh, cognition, kinds of cognition, that kind of thing, like visual, spatial, or you know, language reasoning, or something like that. Um, there's going to be lots of different ways in which these things show up. And so becoming an expert in that really specific thing um, is how you get good at uh, observing and diagnosing and then treating these various things. Can you still observe and diagnose and treat? Yes, but with caution <laughs> or with humility. Caution that you don't diagnose something improperly or incorrectly. That's really important. And then when it comes to treatment, humbly saying, this is something I'm not sure of. I need to learn. I want more information on this. So um, you'll, that'll come up again uh, throughout this presentation and the next one too. So we'll talk more about that. Um, and then also one of the other criteria is it requires the need for services or support uh, or assistance. Okay, let's talk about cerebral palsy. Uh, commonly known as CP, uh, it is a permanent disorder affecting typically muscle tone. So if you remember back, we, we talk about tone in lots of different ways. We talk about it in terms of like the, the generic way that I explain it is like how much you flex. It can be super flexed and high tone or kind of flaccid and limp with low tone. Um, <clears throat> muscle control is also part of that. So how well I uh, flex and relax at different times. Sometimes the muscles just, the brain says signals to automatically flex when it shouldn't. Um, sometimes I try and flex, but I can't uh, because the muscles damage. Maybe it's a signal damage somewhere in between in the case of like spinal cord injuries, things like that. It's all kinds of reasons why muscles don't work the way we either want them to or they they automatically work in ways that are unhelpful for us. So that's kind of related to muscle tone and muscle control. And then posture. Posture, um, particularly from birth or shortly after, 
Um, all those things are starting. That's why it's sort of a developmental thing or kind of early development. Um, the posture can become problematic mostly because when the muscles aren't working, they get stuck in certain places or they get spastic and they move in different ways. Um, it can create all kinds of unique things like contractures, which we've talked about in class before too. Um, it can also affect all these other kind of like, I guess sometimes you could call them secondary things, but they're not really, they're not really secondary. It's not like because of uh, the diagnosis of CP, these other things happen. We'll go through some of those too. But what we're talking about secondary here is they're not like the primary thing that we notice the most. So for instance, perception, uh, we'll talk about, you know, the need for um, an optometrist or an ophthalmologist for, you know, visual changes, some uh, additional hearing testing maybe, because that can be a, a challenge for people with CP too. So these are the other things that are they're not uh, caused by the CP, but they're just sort of secondary issues that come up as a result or along with something like that. Not, let me say that again, not as a result. They come along with. <laughs> um, so perceptions, cognitions, communication, behavior, we'll go through that more. It is the most common childhood disorder. Spina bifida is the next one, which we'll see also. Um, and as with a lot of disorders, we don't really know the exact causes. We have kind of this, this general understanding of when certain kinds of things happen, but we don't exactly know exactly what's the cause of this, what leads to this. The brain is complicated, development is complicated. We do know a lot about it, but there are still complications. So instead of saying this is the cause, we have these categories of when certain things happen and what things we think are associated with that period. So for example, prenatal, referring to before a person is born, sort of in utero, in the, in the belly, uh, in mama's belly, exposure to toxic chemicals uh, is a pot. There's some evidence for that. It's a possibility. Um, blood incompatibility, so blood type incompatibility, that can also be the potential cause for some of this. Um, I'm not familiar with any of the research on these on these two either, so I'm not really sure what to say about those. But just so you know, those are things to probably look into a little more if you're interested in the causes. Um, prenatal, so or, sorry, perinatal during birth or shortly after the birth, kind of like right in that birth period. Uh, it could be related to birth trauma, uh, fetal anoxia or lack of oxygen. So this is like, uh, can happen if the if a child has the cord wrapped around their neck. Um, birth trauma can be related to like, um, I know somebody who was in a car accident when they were born uh, and that could be related to it. Maybe it's a little bit of both, who knows? I mean, when the brain is still developing and it's supposed to be in the sort of the, in the normal circumstances in the natural environment of the womb it's doing specific things and when that gets interrupted that can be considered birth trauma too and then of course the postnatal period so after birth uh could be related to traumatic brain injury or tbi uh meningitis encephalitis encephalitis uh other infections kind of like bacterial infections or something like that that's a possibility toxic chemical exposure anoxia um, and anoxia means could be from like drowning, just lack of oxygen, that's what that means, or something like carbon monoxide exposure, CO exposure, something like that. So there's, you know, when you look back at, you know, why did this happen? We as counselors, sometimes that can be an important element to a person's story of why did this happen and how do we understand who we are, especially related to if there's like, you know, my mother was an alcoholic and she got in a car accident. Was it because of the alcohol? In which case, some people have a tendency to want to blame other people. Or was it a car accident that was not her fault? These things can be important. But I find that more often, it's it's related to a way a person builds their identity and tells their story. Um, it's professionally interesting for us as like public health people, mental health people, something like that. But in terms of doing counseling, the root causes of somebody's disability are far less important to how it manifests in their life and sort of shows up and it's part of their story, something like that. But it's helpful to know. Um, okay, here are some of the, the identifying characteristics or how we classify CP. So uh, hypertonia we've talked about. I just call it too much flex. You know, muscles are too toned. Spasticity is the kind of stuff that happens when there's too much muscle tone and then they shake. Um, Dystonia is like if the muscles are flexing and as a result they're twisting or contorting, 
um, those can lead to contractures. So dystonia is the muscle thing that happens. Contractures is related to the joint inflexibility. Um, as you can see here, a lot of these conditions, once you learn what that specific word means, you can see how those words relate. So in this class, we talk a lot about contractures and spasticity because a lot of these uh, neuromuscular skeletal things, they're part of the same system of movement, movement related issues. So when we know what hypertonia means, we can say, oh, we're flexing. And as a result of too much hypertonia or as a result of hypertonia, which means too much, um, dystonia can be a result. And then as a result of dystonia, we can get contractures. And so all these things kind of fit together. And we're starting to repeat these words enough that hopefully we can kind of start piecing together how they fit. Um, hyperkinetic movement is just sort of like a generic term related to unwanted excessive movements of, of some kind. Um, oftentimes this relates to like con contraction issues. Um, so the, I don't know what, there else, what else there is to say about that exactly. There's different levels of severity. We'll talk about this just in terms of walking here. And then in the next slide, we'll talk about uh, upper limb movement, hand movement, that kind of thing. Um, you can look at these. I don't know if there's much else to say right there, except for that um, when you start to see different people who have this diagnosis of CP, you'll start to see like varying levels of mobility and how much they can walk, either with a walker, using a wheelchair, without a walker. Um, I know I have people in my personal life who walk with a sort of uh, a gait. In other words, um, you know, some back and forth movement and that just, you know, you start to see different presentations of it and you can see it's not so much, again, how important it is for us to know, like, I need to identify what level a person is at or whatever. <laughs> what we want to know is because of the way that they are, does that have any, uh, does it create any challenges in terms of whether we're doing voc rehab, you know, in their world of work? If they have gait issues, is that going to be a long-term issue? So maybe they don't want to do the job of like auto mechanic. They could totally crank the wrench and they might love it, but is that, can, is that pressure on the joint in, in um, non-anatomical ways going to create future problems? Or maybe they want to do it because it creates more self-esteem and, and that's something they haven't been able to get early on in life or something. You know, there's all kinds of considerations, but this stuff is less important to us in terms of how we're going to treat this. Um, However, not unimportant. I don't want to give the impression that it's not important because it can be really helpful in terms of choosing the right kind of interventions, knowing this stuff. But you'll start to get a sense of what it looks like in different people the more exposure you have. Um, what's good now is to be aware of, uh, be aware that these are different classifications that we use to help communicate with other professionals. Um, and that does help us understand different kinds of treatment, um, even though what we're mostly interested in is, okay, what do we do now with this information? And then manual ability, same kind of thing, just, you know, hand hand manipulation with objects. I'm not going to go through those. You can pause it if, go back to that slide and pause it if you want to read those. Think about it a little bit more, but I'm just going to uh, kind of move quickly through that part. Here we go again. Um, these are those things I was saying weren't secondary conditions, but some of them kind of are secondary conditions or happen alongside, depending. <laughs> so uh, visioning, vision and hearing challenges. Communication difficulties is a really big one. Because uh, CP affects the muscles, uh, including the tongue and the mouth, communication can be a challenge for some people. However, it's really important to note that it's not related to intellect. So this, this uh, condition of dysarthria, um, it can be like, I know the words I want to say, I know how to say them, I know how to develop sentences, I know I'm a smart person who knows what is supposed to be coming out. However, because I can't move my mouth the same way everybody else moves it, it might come out sounding something like this because, and so people int interpret that as being like a communication, is not knowing what they're trying to say or something like that. Um, or just not being able to communicate, not being able to understand is maybe more my fault than the person who is working with the muscle issue. So um, just in terms of rehab counseling, knowing that these kind of things are happening and not making the mistaken assumption that a person is not sure what they want, what they need, how they feel, all that kind of stuff is really, really important. Um, we'll touch just briefly on augmented communication, but we're not going to focus so much on that. That's kind of the uh, what we want to learn. We want to understand how to, how to use those tools. 
identifying those tools is more the in the realm of speech language pathology and occupational therapists and that kind of thing. Um, uh, for us, though, I will say that uh, that's related to a person's mental health condition and how they communicate what their condition is and also the world of work. If somebody's going to use that augmented device they got from their SLP or OT, uh, we get to say, how do we help other people understand the, how to have that relationship with them and how do we facilitate that relationship? So it might require that we learn these tools, but we're not often going to be the one that's sort of telling people what they need to use and how to use it and, you know, telling them all their options and all that kind of thing. Um, back on track here, seizures, uh, intellectual or learning abilities can can be, there can be challenges, or although potentially not. Behavioral difficulties, same thing, maybe, maybe not. Bowel and bladder difficulties, contractures, uh, not just contractures. It's it's a little bit weird the way I have it here, but contractures are possibilities. Scoliosis is a possibility. Osteoporosis can be um, something to pay attention to, just like you know, bones degrading, um, or just not can not maintaining their strength. Um, also, dental issues can be a thing. So all of these things are important to sort of like look into and understand in terms of uh, a person's condition. Did I skip one? Yeah, I did. Okay, uh, here's some of the different folks who may be involved in this. It's kind of an abbreviated list. It's not everybody. But physical therapy, I'm going to start using acronyms, by the way, just so we get comfortable with the acronyms. Um, but physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, orthotics. So it's really common if somebody has, um, oh, let's see, because of this dystonia we're talking about earlier, if they have like joint irregularities, they can either do a couple, one of a couple of things. They can get surgery to correct the joint and try and sort of grow it back into shape so it works a little better for them. <laughs> or having a, a some sort of orthotic or brace or something like that on the outside can help uh, muscles uh, sort of retrain themselves, so to speak, or to ch change the way a person sits or walks or something like that. So some uh, external tools can be used as orthotics. Uh, medications for some uh, parts of the condition, sometimes like muscle relaxers or something for spasticity, that kind of thing. Surgical interventions, of course, we mentioned. Speech language pathology, um, that relates not only to communication, but also chewing and swallowing. Uh, those muscles are involved in, uh, if somebody has the condition of CP, chewing and swallowing are related to muscles. And so that's what an SLP does, just not just about speech and language, but also about chewing and swallowing and um, appropriate eating and that kind of thing. By the way, anybody who has difficulty eating, um, they can run the risk, it's not on this list, but they can run the risk of respiratory challenges too because of the potential to either um, uh, aspirate food or liquid, something like that. So there's a potential heightened risk for things like pneumonia and respiratory infections and stuff like that too. Um, I mentioned some of these other ones, but ophthalmology, optometry, nutritionist, bowel and bladder training, and then of course mental health counseling as well. And that's that's what we really want to spend a little more time focusing on here. Uh, as far as counseling, it's not really in the textbook of, of what to look for. And, and I wish we could spend more time on this because I think this is probably more related to what we want to spend our time on and what we want to understand and learn. But something that's pretty normal, when somebody has an outwardly visible, obvious difference in sort of deviation from the norm of what bodies are supposed to look like, imagine the, sh the short kid, the chubby kid, the skinny kid. I mean, everybody looks at their body and says, how is it not like the ideal? Think of this just as an extension of that. Uh, some people come out and say, you know what, I love my body, whether it's skinny or fat or small or big, or, you know, my legs are long, or my body is, my torso is short. <laughs> Everybody who's got something that's sort of deep, or their nose is really big, that's, that's my thing. Um, everybody who's got something like that, it can either be really painful and difficult for them, and there can be shame and all kinds of compensatory behaviors, like I compensate for something by like making jokes about it and just talking about it so that it's uncomfortable for everybody else instead of me, <laughs> something like that. Or people can adjust and adapt perfectly fine and just not be bothered by that thing. It's no different here, but there's a higher, uh, higher likelihood of body image issues because of the obvious, what we'll call defects or differences from the norm. What's the right word? I'm thinking of it. You guys are saying it out there. Deviations from the norm. That's what I'm thinking of. 
Um, because of all the 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 visible disability, this is common not just with CP, but like lots and lots of different disabilities, particularly visible ones, but not always. Um, other kids can be mean. And before kids learn anything like tact and kindness, some people just have it at birth, it seems like, or they learn it from their families early or whatever. But kids are mean, and we all know that. And so as a result, people can isolate a little bit more, particularly when it comes to recess and gym class, if movement is the thing that's uh, pr uh, rewarded in those environments. But just bullying, depression, anxiety can come along with some of that, like, you know, body image issues and sa being sad about about the way other people are treating them and just like all kinds of stuff. But those are kind of normal, normal issues that come along with this. Um, it's not as common for people with conditions like CP or even spina bifida, which we're going to talk about. It's not as common that they lead to things like conduct disorders and behavior disorders, although it's not uh, not out of the realm of possibility. Um, but these are the most common things. And then it's also important to talk about sexuality training. We've mentioned that with just about every single disability. But there's a sense, especially with, with kids, um, and even up into adulthood, to, to just completely avoid sexuality. And sort of, you know, when, when kids are small, when they're infants, you just don't talk about sexuality because they're not really sexual beings yet. They use their penises and vaginas to go pee. And that's kind of it. Like, there's no obsession or fascination with them other than the fact that it's there and they like, oh, what is this body part? I explore it and try to figure out, like, is this different than my finger? Yes, it has this other function, right? Like, there's that kind of curiosity with it. But sexuality doesn't become a thing until, I don't know, like, grade school? But fifth, I remember I had sex ed in fifth grade and we were all sitting there looking at overhead slides on the, tr the transparency projector thing. <laughs> I'm dating myself a little bit. But you're looking at slides of the anatomy and everybody's giggling and whatever. But like that was kind of an important and helpful time for me to understand. There are these things that I see in movies and I hear about in conversation, but I don't really know what they're for, or how they work. Right. So um, that doesn't always happen with people in with disabilities because we make assumptions wrongly that they don't. They're not really worried about that stuff. And they're not having those kind of relationships. And they don't need to be trained with that because we're so focused on making sure they can write in a checkbook. And so we forget about it. They need sex ed too, just like everybody else. And, you know, whatever. So that can be an important consideration as well. Um, this one, for, for vocational issues, I'm going to leave this one really uh, empty. There's a ton to say about it. Absolutely a ton. Um, but just because of... I'm just going to leave it leave it like this for now. <laughs> we won't talk about why. I've probably complained about why in other areas of why we're not providing more of a vocational emphasis in these slides. Um, but obviously movement is an issue and fatigue management can be an issue too. So you can probably imagine by the other things we've been saying already that uh, working through some identity related things, that can be important. Working through how a person relates to other social beings is an important concept when we're talking about any vocational career counseling with people. Um, here, here, it's it's more mostly about movement and the other kind of you know quote unquote secondary conditions that we talked about earlier. That's what we're going to be spending that this is sort of emphasized on. But paying attention to fatigue is something that's common with other disabilities as well, so it's worth mentioning. Okay, let's shift gears just a little bit. And let's talk about the second most common childhood condition, which is spina bifida. What we're talking about here is neural tube defects. And so this is not really an issue with the brain itself, but the spinal column or the neural tube. So the, uh, what we're referring to here is if a vertebrae either doesn't have one of the bones or there's a gap somewhere in between, and, and part, of the, part of the spinal column can... Uh, come out of that. That's kind of what we're talking about here. There's some pictures in your textbook if you want to look at them. But there's three main kinds. One of them is spinal bifida oculata. Oc <laughs> occulta? Oculata. <laughs> nice try. Um, occulta, or an opening in the vertebrae. In this case, the spinal column's coming down, there's an opening, and it's just sort of exposed. And sometimes you might not even notice that that's happening um, until later on in childhood either an accident uh makes it known or you know there's sort of an observed gap in this in the vertebrae or something like that 
um, but it's just an opening. It can create potential risks and potential problems, uh, but they're not always obvious. Uh, meninges cell is a protrusion of the spinal cord covering through the through the vertebrae. So it's kind of when the when the not the spinal cord itself, but some of the the covering sheathing can pop out uh, of that gap in the spinal column. Um, it can lead to uh, other kinds of issues. It can be corrected, but because of that, uh, maybe during the process of correction or just because of the development of it, um, it can lead to spinal cord injuries too. In other words, the nerves are not doing exactly what they're supposed to be doing. Think of it like this way. Um, if you had an electric cable that was going into an outlet in your house or maybe a light switch or something, and the the insulate, the, the plastic or rubber, or whatever it is, insulation on the outside of the wires gets cut. And then it kind of like opens up and bulges out. It may not be a problem, but then it could also be a problem. So maybe there's electricity coming out of it or the potential for there to be a spark or arc or something like that. Um, it could be a problem, but doesn't necessarily mean there is one. Uh, okay, I'm going to try this last word. Uh, Milo meningitis. Giselle, myelo meningocell. <laughs> it's, it's a long one. That's when not only the, the sheathing pops out of the vertebrae, but also the spinal cord or the, some of the nerves themselves. Um, that usually leads to more spinal cord injury or SCI, as I say up there, um, and can be more problematic. But that's what we're talking about here is we're talking about that spinal column uh, nerve or bone abnormalities that lead to these complications. Uh, potential, uh, often it can come with hydrocephalus, which we've talked about before, or fluid built up in the brain, which means sometimes what uh, happens there is a shunt is put into the brain to uh, drain some of that the cranial or spinal fluid into the abdomen is usually the place they do it, apparently. Um, other conditions that can come as a result of this is scoliosis. And scoliosis is just curvature of the spine, something like that. Um, either it happens... Uh, for the same reasons as, you know, during the developmental process, the spine as a result of the way that it grows is curved and has missing pieces or gaps or something. Um, or it can potentially happen as a result of, of, the, of the, way it's, the way it grows up initially. So like later on, it can make those curvatures, something like that. Uh, urinary tract infections or UTIs and decubitus ulcers can be common, what we call pressure sores or bed sores, those can be common. Um, and the functional limitations, the same stuff that we talked about with CP um, in terms of what a person is able to do, the jobs they're able to hold, um, it can be very similar to, it's uh, like those musculoskeletal things, only there's just a different cause, just a different uh, way it shows up, but it's uh, very similar. And then I think this is the last slide here. Yeah, it's the last one. Let's talk about uh, parental involvement because it comes up in this chapter in sort of this I don't know, secondary kind of way. Like this relates to a lot, a lot of different kinds of disabilities, but in this chapter specifically, um, they kind of spend a little bit more time on it. I think it's worth mentioning, but it's not just about CP or spina bifida. This is with just about any disability, but I wanted to mention it anyway, include it in here. Um, one of the things we're talking about are changes in normal development. So it's particularly with developmental dis disorders, but it could be any disability. Kids normally, as they grow up, they start to, we've used the word emancipate or separate from their parents. I'm a kid and I need you. I'm absolutely dependent on you. But I'm going to start separating myself by saying like, well, I'm my own person. And I'm not, I'm, but I'm still part of the family. And I need you to cook me food and, and to, you know, change my diapers. But I also want to uh, try walking on my own. And then as they get older, they say, no, you can't tell me what to do. And they're sort of just like progressively saying, uh, getting closer to that point where they're like, give me the keys to your car, please. And I'm going to have my own family, please. And all that stuff, right? Like that's the whole, one of the big parts of development is kids becoming more independent and leaving the nest, so to speak. However, it's probably pretty obvious to most of us that kids do this differently. Kids with disabilities of just about any kind do this differently because sometimes I need help in certain areas, but not in others. And where a person needs help and where they don't need help, what are their strengths and what are their limitations? This is one of the huge issues with understanding disability. 
uh, both from the parents' perspective, but also from providers. And this is one of the things that we, as uh, mental health and uh, disability experts, that we can talk to people about and we can help people understand, is identifying where you're actually needed and where you're not. Because these other things can happen. One of them, we've probably all heard the term helicopter parents. Excuse me, I'm still getting over a little bit of sickness, so if you hear me getting like really weird, it's because I am. <laughs> the sound, <laughs> I sound congested or something. Um, helicopter parents, these are the people that say, I need to take care of this person, I'm gonna meet their needs, and sometimes they do that because they actually need to, right? Like, I have to help this person with this thing. And then just as an extension, when this person is supposed to grow and learn to do it themselves, the parents say, no, you can't do that. Either they, they don't let a person grow into their own ability to take care of that one thing, or they make mistakenly and think that they need to take care of all these other things too. So um, we could probably talk about examples of this all over the place, but it's just not letting a person uh, practice their own separation, emancipation, their own independence, that kind of thing. When they can't do that, we say, okay, I have to walk, watch over them, not only do these things for them, but to protect them from all the dangers of the outside world, the bullies, or the people who are going to try and do things for them that we think they shouldn't, so I'm going to protect them from them, from those other people who are doing the stuff for them, but, <laughs> like, because you can see it gets complicated. So helicopter parents are not just the people that are protective, but they're also the people that do things for, for people. So what happens is it can create dependence, either on this person for... Uh, actual functional assistance, or if I say, no, as the parent, I'm not going to do that thing for you. I'm going to make you do it, but I'm going to protect you from all the other bad people. So it can be dependence on me for safety, security, support, health assistance, whatever it is, it's all kinds of things. But the whole point is that there's too much parental involvement. Parents are around too much and they shouldn't be. The hard part is, is when do you say no? When do you help out? What are the boundaries? When do you let a person assume their own risk to go out and try some new things? Uh, and when do you say, no, I'm going to be the parent here and I'm going to, to make sure you, to, I keep you safe, that kind of thing. Hard stuff. Um, many of you have kids with disabilities yourself and can maybe attest to the challenge of like, when, when do you know when to say no? And when do you know when to say yes? And when do you know when to let go? And all that stuff. It's just, it's hard in any parenting case. Uh, and this is no exception. Um, the one other term I didn't mention here is learned helplessness. So people can just sort of start depending on like, well, I don't need to even ask to do this on my own because somebody's just going to take care of it for me. And then they grow up and they find themselves in, a, in an adult situation where they're like, wait a minute, you mean I have to do these things on my own? Somebody else isn't just going to do it for me? <laughs> right? My, my wife, who I didn't talk about very much, uh, some some lectures I talk about her more, but today I just am not feeling it. Uh, but one of the things that she does sometimes is she's like, I'm so used to other people making decisions for me. Uh, excuse me, husband, what do you think about this? And I'm like, I, I, I'm not going to tell you what I think about it, because then you're going to just be influenced by my decision or by my opinion. And I want and I need to hear you tell me your opinion and then I'll tell you how I feel. <laughs> so we go through this one in my house all the time. Uh, and I think it's related to kind of like this thing. Other people were telling her for most of her life that this is, you know, what you should do, how you should feel, what you should be careful of, blah, blah, blah. And now I'm like, no, you decide. You figure it out. You're a big girl. You can do this. Um, which, by the way, I'm not going to go into this too much. But if any of you are out there sitting there thinking, that guy sounds kind of arrogant. Like, you know, he's talking down to her. That's something else that that I that we try to be careful of because if I'm doing that all the time, then she says like, "Don't treat me like a child," and I'm like, "Okay, you're right. I don't want to. How do I do this differently? How do I do it better? You know, how do I encourage you to be more independent and stronger while also not being the one to be like the cheerleader who's talking down to you like you're a child? Like that's a constant navigation in our household. Okay, the other one, uh, other than. Helicopter parents are neglectful parents. And this doesn't just mean people who are like, I don't care about my kids. Um, it's also the people who are like, I'm going to hold you to the same standards I hold all my other children or the way I was held to standards as a kid. And so it creates these unrealistic expectations. Or I just say, you know, I want to give you your support, 
but I don't know how to do how to support you in the unique way that you need to. So we're not talking about bad parents here. What we're talking about is either uneducated, untrained, unfamiliar, whatever parents, or those parents who are like, no, I think you can really do this. I'm going to really strongly support you to do this thing. And then kids aren't ready for that and they fail, which can lead to things like low self-esteem or repetitive failure throughout life or something like that. These internalized beliefs that I'm just not going to make it, that kind of stuff. So low self-esteem, low self-efficacy is another term the, or the belief that I can accomplish certain things. Um, those are all part of this. So I really don't want to make helicopter parents and neglectful parents, when you see them, sometimes they can be the most annoying and frustrating people that you'll meet. <laughs> and when they come on too strong or, or, or seem so passive, they don't even care. Those can be sometimes pretty uh, apparent situations, but there are also plenty of times where these things happen, both of these things happen, and people can be excellent parents and just not really know and, and be struggling with this, like, how much do I help? When do I not help? And these are all things that, that all of us do at times as parents. So I don't want to make these sound like you want to villainize the people who are doing them because they're doing it wrong and they're doing it bad. That's not the case. Oftentimes, it's we all need support when we're parenting and these bigger challenges or more difficult things regardless of the disability are just things that we need help with all of us <laughs> you know even if we think we know everything about it we still need help just sort of keeping us confident and, and supportive and helping us stay consistent with our kids and all that kind of stuff so um i just want to make sure i emphasize these are not to be used as derogatory or pejorative terms to villainize other people as doing it wrong parents are trying hard and we're doing our best with information that we frankly don't have a lot of good information. Let me say that again. We frankly don't have a lot of as much good information as we would like sometimes <clears throat> or the support to make good decisions even if we have all the information. Okay, uh, I'm going to stop it there. See you guys later.